Hello everybody, I'm here with the Dorsey family in uh, just outside of Baltimore, Maryland. And uh, the first time I met uh, these two young teenagers, it was uh, last October. I came down uh, to Baltimore with uh, Steve Carrington for his, uh, his homecoming for his new album at Kino, Kino Corner at the Keystone Corner. And uh, the night before that, I went to a jam session in Baltimore and, uh, and I met these young teenagers and, uh, and their mom. And I, I want you guys to introduce yourselves. Uh, greetings, everyone. I'm Bernadine Dorsey, the mom. Hello, everyone. My name's Ephraim Dorsey. Hello, my name's Evan Dorsey. And, uh, I'd like for you to talk about mom a little bit about uh, when uh, the kids were growing up, when you first realized that uh, you had two really talented uh, kids on your hands. Um, I actually didn't really realize it until after they started uh, Contemporary Arts Jazz Camp with Carl Grubbs. Um, they were in fourth and fifth grade and they wanted uh, more music after you know the band school and band ended. Um, we watched the documentary that went Marcellus had of, uh, in New Orleans when all the kids were playing. They were like they wanted to go to camp, um, and I was I had even called down to see if there were any kids camp. I was going to actually drive them to New Orleans to do some you know jazz camps, uh, and then I remember that my daughter, who's 24 now, 25, uh, she played for Carl Groves um, at St. Paul School for Girls where he taught jazz band. So I called just to see if he knew anywhere I could take them. And he said, well, hey, I got a jazz camp starting Monday. You know, you can get them here. Um, so signed them up and took them in there. Um, and then before I took them, Ephraim, who at the time was actually struggling with, because he was so small, so skinny, struggling with breathing. Um, so he went to camp that first day. And when he came back, that, that first day of camp, they were in heaven. Like their eyes were going. It was like they were just, they had this, hunger and it was like they couldn't wait to get back and Carl called me that night and told me hey they have something special he said it's something deep in both of them he said which is rare but I see it and then um it just took off from there so it was Carl Grubbs uh Craig Austin was there Blake Meister I don't know if you know Blake yes I do um Eric Kennedy who else was there uh, Wayne Johnson yeah, but Justin um Taylor. yeah Justin Taylor was there but um he actually had professionals in the camp, and sometimes it's rare back then to find camps that actually, you know, had professionals. So, and from there, it just, it just was not, it's been nonstop. Yeah. So, Ephraim, what was it about that uh, first time that uh, you experienced uh, the whole music scene? What was it that uh, enlightened you and made you want to really get involved? Um. Well, I always enjoyed listening to different types of music, but at the time, I never really saw the live scene. And when I did, I just realized the whole chemistry that happened between the musicians. Like, I at the time, I didn't know what the terminology was for it, but like, it was just crazy for me. In my mind, I was seeing, you know, a saxophone player play this and the piano player and the drummer would follow him like right along. And they were just like, okay, you're going here, now I'm going to go here with you. And that whole thing, that's something that I wanted for myself. I wanted to be able to do that myself. So I started to practice um, different ideas and concepts, just being immersed in the live you know, setting, being in jam sessions and being in concerts all the time where people constantly embrace you and bring you up to the bandstand. You get like a first-hand experience of what the music is. And uh, so now, who is your uh, favorite musicians and who were some of the musicians that inspired you? Um, at the time, I'm going to uh, speak like at the time. Mm -hmm. um, it was mainly Miles Davis and uh, John Coltrane. And um, as I started to grow a little bit, I researched John Coltrane even further um, because I only knew him for the kind of blue album. And when I realized that he had this whole different world of spirituality, it just, that, at that point, I was just like, okay, that's, that's what I need to do, like right there. Well, you know, uh, you know, I'm a volunteer at the John and Alice Coltrane home out in Dix Hills, Long Island, and 
when the folks uh, from the Coltrane home hear this, you know, they're going to be uh, very, very excited uh, to hear that, that uh, John Coltrane was one of your earliest uh, inspirations. And, uh, and hearing you play, it, you can really uh, see that uh, some of that, uh, some of that uh, fruit that was planted has really grown. Thank you. So even uh, the first time I heard you play at the jam session, you know, uh, it took me a, a couple of seconds to realize that, you know, that was a, a young girl playing. <laughs> and uh, and it, the thing that most amazed me about hearing you play is that at such a young age, you developed an incredible voice uh, in your playing. And, uh, and in, through your solos, you have... Uh, I found a way to, to, to really express yourself and to express that voice. When did that first come about? Um, well, first starting, it actually took me a while to be able to do that. Um, it was really difficult for me to express myself fully, and at the time I didn't really know how to do that. And so that didn't really come until recently, maybe like two years ago, when I just let go, I let loose, and I found it a lot easier to express myself. And what what are you, uh, and who or and what is some of your inspirations? Um, so I'm gonna speak at the time too. Um, I really just like to listen to everything and a whole bunch of different genres all at the same time. Um, when we started the jazz camp is when I became knowledgeable of all the past jazz musicians because you know at first um, I was just hearing what was on the radio. It was a lot of black music, should I say, and so I heard a lot of Terrace Martin, who's a modern saxophonist today, and so um, I did a lot of research to see these people's influences and stuff, and so I heard John Coltrane, Miles Davis, you know, like the beginner stuff that everybody transcribes, that's really where I started at, so they were my influences at the time. Now, you know, uh, on the scene today, there are some pretty incredible uh, female saxophonists, mm -hmm. uh, and the person that comes to mind for me is Letitia Benjamin. And, uh, and I see a lot of her in you in some ways. I, I don't know if you would agree with that or not, but uh, she's uh, very, very exciting. And, and I see you coming up uh, in that realm of being somebody that's real, real exciting and can uh, really express uh, yourself on the, on the saxophone and particularly in the idiom of jazz. And uh, so what do you think your future looks like uh, on the music scene? Um, honestly, I see myself, I don't know, playing what I want to play, um, bringing back a band with me and being able to travel and play and express myself, you know. It's all about healing people and stuff like that. So just looking at the world right now, I know a lot of people are going to need healing soon. And so I want to be able to do that in the best way I possibly can. So now, you know, since the last time I saw you, the world has changed so much. And uh, so now we're in the middle of a pandemic. And uh, so what do you think musically, uh, the world, uh, particularly the world of music, what do you think it's going to look like going forward? And secondly, how do you think, uh, particularly now that probably won't be a lot of, uh, you know, in-house venues uh, to play, uh, how do you expect to uh, express your voices uh, going forward? Um, well, in the music scene, I feel like once and if this all calms down, it's going to be a lot more authentic because, um, you know, being in the house by yourself, you know, you get to realize how much you miss playing with other people and how much of that connection is really important. So I feel like once we are able to do that again, it's going to be really authentic. Um, and I feel like for a while now it's going to be a lot of online stuff just because it's going to take a while to get to that point. But um, yeah, I feel like eventually we'll get back to being on the stage with the people you know you love to play with. And stuff. So Ephraim, what's your thoughts about that and how do you uh, expect to uh, uh, create more content uh, as it relates to uh, your online presence? Um, in terms of my online presence, I do want to release more music um, digitally and uh, make sure that it's available on all platforms so that anybody who uh, wants to hear it is able to hear it. Um, because as Evan said, uh, 
healing needs to be happening on this earth right now and that's what I want to be able to do and make sure that everybody can do it and um, once and if this like she said settles down um, it's gonna be an experience worthwhile because none of us really realized what we had until like it was gone like we didn't even realize how much we appreciated the scene until it was taken away from us so um, that's something that I'm definitely going to start embracing once I come back. And, um, like, I think it was just, like, two days ago where I was able to play with a band for the first time in, like, mm -hmm. a while. And at first it was a little weird because I wasn't used to it. I was so used to being in the house that I forgot what it fe felt like. So it took me a little while to be in the groove again, but, like, it felt incredibly amazing to be able to play with those musicians again. And uh, that's an experience I definitely missed for a, like for a while. So now, what do you think uh, going forward <laughs> with the uh, the kids, with their education and and their uh, their music endeavors? Uh, what you, what are you, what are your expectations going forward? Um, considering how it is like right now, which everyone's saying this is going to be the new norm, or I don't know if it will be, but we're going to adjust, number one. Um, and then, even with the education, I think it's important for them to remain bonding with their classmates. Because um, that's so important. I mean, I still have all my friends. Um, and that final year, that senior year, with the seniors that you, even though you're a year behind them, you're still close and you get to go to their graduations and celebrate them and send them off, you know. That's gone. It's like you can't even go to their home and drop off a gift. You can mail it. Um, so, um, as far as the music, uh, we're gonna have to adjust until because you know we don't want to stop sharing the gift. Cause that's once we realize and it's a gift and um, and when usually when you're given a gift and like to both of them, you have a responsibility and it's not about you. So it's easy to play when you feel like playing. Um, you can play all night long when you feel like playing. But the days that you don't feel like playing, that's when it's your responsibility. You got to kick it in another gear because, again, it's your gift, but it's not your gift. So when it's a job. It's really a job, you know, when you look at it. You, even though you love it, but you're not going to love it. Nobody wants to play all the time. That's right. Even the that's best right. musicians, like, every day they don't feel like playing. But they come out, we don't know what they're going through. And I was explaining that to them, like, you never know as adults, as your mom. I don't, I'm don't. i not going to tell you everything that I'm going through. But when you're playing, it's helping me or it's helping the next person. And you never know what your audience is going through. But I can guarantee you as a, an audience that's black, maybe 85 to 90% of them are just going through something. So just always keep that in mind. So finally, uh... I want you guys to give uh, young musicians your age uh, just a word of encouragement and a word of inspiration. Okay. Um, well, for young musicians, whether you found your voice or you're struggling to find it, um, just keep pushing um, because right now, no matter what stage you're at right now, you're way ahead of most of the musicians you may look up to right now. Um, because most of the musicians probably didn't even start until like their 20s or maybe in their late ages. Um, so right now you're really ahead of the game. Just keep studying, uh, keep grinding, and make sure that you're doing it for the right reason. Um, I want you to focus on what feels good first as opposed to what you're supposed to do. And most importantly, I want you to study who you want to study and not just people that you feel like you have an obligation to study. Um, because a lot of the time when you focus on the musicians that you want to listen to and the ones that you actually enjoy listening to, you'll find your voice a lot quicker than, you know, you wasting your time on something that you're not even going to end up using. So just keep that in mind when you're studying. And um, I believe in you. <laughs> um, well, I'm going to put this out to the female musicians that are my age, um, you know, try, well, yeah, I'm going to say try not to be intimidated um, with the idea that you may be the only one out there because there's a lot of us that are out there and, um, you know, like being on the stage as a female, it's more important that you need to 
speak, say what you want to say. Um, um, yeah, so I'm going to say all that stuff that he said, like keep pushing, keep studying, you know, that's really important. Um, unfortunately, we have to put more effort in to get out there. So even though it's a lot, um, it's going to pay off in the end. So you just got to keep going. Be the best that you can be. So I just want to say uh, thank you so very much and thank you for your time. And I really, really look forward to seeing you guys in the future and all the best. Thank, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you so much.